how'd you go from basically where you started to like where you are like right now? It wasn't kind of the crazy unicorn startup of, hey, if you spend this much to acquire a customer, here's what you can generate in revenue. Having that long-term orientation is just kind of a, a great frame of reference to run a business. I think, it, I think it makes it easier to be more successful over the long-term as well. What do you do as a CEO on a daily basis? Like, what does your day look like from start to finish? How can I be most helpful to the organization on a day-to-day -day basis? They're just working 12 months a year at minimum 11 months a year. I'm like, geez, this is a completely different business sometimes. When that long care tsunami comes, those leads calling in, you've got one shot. You better make a count. It is a great day to be part of the dirt life. If you ever wondered what over 90 trucks looks like in a lawn care company with over $15 million in revenue, this is it with Mainly Grass. Joining me in the studio, we've got Edward and Liam talk about Mainly Grass in Portland. Ed Edward, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, James and Liam. Great to see you guys. <laughs> well, let's just jump right into things, man. So like uh, Lee and I, we're all just talking. You joined Mainly Grass back in 2021 as the CFO. And today, what's your current role? And what would you say your main responsibilities are? So my current role is uh, I became the CEO of Mainly Grass in January 2023. And in terms of roles and responsibilities, I'd say by and large, I'm still uh, I'm still figuring those uh, figuring those out. They kind of run, run the gambit day to day is, uh, as I kind of figure out more and more how to be kind of really the most effective version of a CEO I can be for the Manning Grass team. Amazing. And you, we were mentioned before, that's about 90 trucks. And how many locations are you guys working out of? So we have five branches and then we have an additional office where our account managers sit. So six locations in total, but five that we run operations out of. And then in respect to like um, number of technicians to managers to people like on the C-suite, how many people would you say at, at the entire company? So uh, we have about 100 employees, um, 67 of which are technicians. Okay, well, the majority of our audience here, Edward, they're business owners. Some of them are just getting going. Many people, though, are kind of in the mid hundreds of thousands of dollars, usually in a home service business. Yeah, that's crazy, man. Yeah, so what's like your like background? Like, how did you get to like the CEO of like a fifteen million dollar plus company? Like, what was your background? Did you have like a CEO experience before? Like, how did you go from basically where you started to like where you are like right now? Just give us like your background. Yeah, definitely. So I actually started my career working in venture capital. I was based out in San Francisco, uh, working for a venture capital firm that invested primarily in software companies. You know, doing deal sourcing, due diligence for them. Over that time, the venture industry kind of increasingly got crowded and more crowded, more crowded. And for me, it was kind of like, how do you develop an expertise in this? How do you have a competitive advantage of it in it? And for me, that kind of led to increasingly drifting to more, you know, mainline industries, more tangible businesses uh, that kind of made sense of, hey, if you spend this much to acquire a customer, here's what you can generate in revenue. It wasn't kind of the crazy unicorn startup of, hey, we're going to try to grow 300% year over year and burn a ton of cash along the way. And hopefully it works out. I just found myself drawn more to kind of like, traditional operating businesses. Ultimately, that led to a leading investment in a textile company as a textile distribution business. And at that point, was really more interested in being on the operating side than the investing side, kind of rolling, my, rolling up my sleeves there, joined help on sales and marketing, and then uh, became the, the CFO of that textile distribution business. And then was really into, uh, and, and that was still kind of a growth oriented uh, type atmosphere, like at its core. Uh, it wasn't kind of a traditional venture, but it's still very growth oriented. Um, but you know, at that time was really interested in firms that really had a much more long-term hold orientation. So came across Chenmark, um, actually wrote them a cold email and they were nice enough to reply. Uh, so Chenmark buys businesses from retiring owners and never sells them, which is obviously profoundly different from your kind of traditional private equity model, but also enables some, some pretty kick-ass stuff in regard to, you know, making very meaningful investments in the organization where you wouldn't necessarily have the latitude to do that if it's like we're buying a business and, and selling it in five years. Having that long-term orientation is just kind of a, a great frame of reference to run a business. I think, it, I think it makes it easier to be more successful over the long term as well. So I joined Chenmark. I was at one of uh, the landscaping companies Chenmark owns and then joined Mainly Grass's CFO in uh, September 2021. And then again, became the CEO of Mainly Grass in, in September 2023. I mean, uh, excuse me, January 2023. Awesome. I see. You sent an email to like the parent company, Chenmark, like a cold yeah. email. I'm like, cold what email. Did that, what did that email say? Way too long of an email. Way too long of an email. It's great that they replied. Uh, but it was just talking about kind of my experience today and why I was really interested in kind of what they were doing. I wasn't asking for a role or anything like that. I was just trying to kind of better understand uh, what they did and, and what they invested in and, you know, 
how, how they were kind of approaching this whole uh, acquisition space. So that conversation led to another conversation and ultimately um, I came aboard. Very cool. So you had like quite the like the 180 in terms of like a career. Like you're working like in San Francisco, you said, and then emailed Palmer with Chenmark all the way in the Northeast in Portland. And uh, then eventually went from like venture capital all the way to like lawn care. So like a full 180, that's really cool. Um, I guess like for us, like we're only at about 2.5 million right now revenue. So you guys are pretty much five times our size. What is it? take like what do you guys do what do you do as a ceo on a daily basis like what does your day look like from start to finish to be able to run maintain five locations 100 employees just give us like an insight of like what does a day look like inside of edward yeah definitely so i mean i think the biggest thing is that like when i came aboard you know mainly grass was already on the larger side so i have i have infinite respect for 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 you guys and others who are starting from zero and building it you know from the ground up i mean it, that's that's really no joke to do and, and certainly a grind along the way so you know, I, I can't really speak to, you know, what that takes in regard to kind of what it takes now and kind of where I where I spend my time. I think you're always trying to figure out two things, right? How can I be most helpful to the organization on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure it's headed in the right direction? But also how can I carve out time in that more long-term oriented way of, hey, how are we going to grow our customer account by 10%, 20%, 30%? Part of that is that day-to-day -day execution and kind of holding ourselves accountable to that standard. But the other part of that is kind of zooming out a little bit and saying, hey, what are the big levers that we should be leaning into more? What are the products that we should be spending time digging into that we can't use this season, but we might be able to use next season that could be important and impactful for us? So I think trying to you know allocate time into those two buckets, I'd say, it's very easy to just get sucked into the day to day because it's it's fun and it's an awesome team and it's great to get in the mix. But you know, obviously, super important to 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 focus. You know, I have the, the unique opportunity to be able to try to focus on those higher leverage opportunities that are going to drive us forwards. You know, year over year. You know, which. If you're kind of in the day-to-day -day fray, that can be sometimes hard to do. Interesting. So like walk me through like a little bit with like mainly grass. So you guys have a decentralized call center that takes in all the calls, customer service and sales. And then you have five operating branches with branch managers. Could you just like take me like a little bit like a, like the structure? Does that call center do sales and customer service? Do they do the routing? Just show me like how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So it, it, it certainly varies, right? And I think the biggest thing we're always trying to think about is what can we do on a quote unquote corporate level? that enables branch managers to not be kind of you know stuck in the slog of just some of those day-to-day -day elements. So like a specific example of that is on the recruiting side. You know, there's so much outreach that has to be done to potential candidates, so many screener calls. That's perfectly set up for Kristen, who's our HR manager, who does all that, right? And her day is just stacked with meetings, talking to potential candidates. And those folks that um, could be great hires are then, you know, passed to the branch managers. Something like that, I think, makes a ton of sense to have on a corporate level to kind of help with filtering and volume for branch managers. And then I think there's other elements that are more important for there to be ownership on a branch basis. And so, for example, routing, which used to be centralized, is now done at a branch level. I think, cool. you know, I, I do think that is, it's, it's obviously a, a burden on branch managers' plates, you, you know, and a non-trivial one at that. But I think kind of having that ownership there of they know their territory incredibly well. What does a good route look like? What does a bad route look like? holding techs accountable in terms of completing or not completing a route. I think that feedback loop is a little shorter and they have more kind of line of sight on what's working and not working in regard to routing specifically. So I think that's one where I think not necessarily as clear cut, but I think you know, 60, 40, it's been, it's been more beneficial doing on a, on a branch basis. Got it. Okay. So the branch is all the routing and then all the call center handles, all the sales and customer service. Yeah. What so I always thought was really cool main grass is that like you actually don't have sales reps and customer service reps. You're called account managers. Can you talk a little bit more on that, please? Yeah, definitely. So um, our account managers uh, have quite the multifaceted job. They're doing a lot of customer experience stuff and a lot of sales stuff. We do do kind of a little splitting in regard to this year, we started a sales queue and a customer experience queue and kind of rotate um, that a little bit just so there can be a little bit of like, you know, when a call comes in, it's a little more specific about what that call is going to be about. It's not necessarily perfect every time, but at least it's like, hey, I'm going to be getting, you know, this is going to be a sales call, this is going to be a customer experience call. But the idea behind that is, you know, growing things is definitely a partnership with the customer. And I think, you know, sometimes it can be easy on the sales side to oversell or overpromise. Um, and I think there's a lot of benefit for the same person who's selling it being the same person that that customer is going to speak with about what's working and what's not working. Um, and I think that continuity is, is, is really powerful and, and impactful uh, for the customer. 
And I think volume fluctuates. It's just so hard to plan. You know, I don't know about you guys, like we get slammed with lead volume on Mondays and Tuesdays, and then it's a little quieter. So it feels like a perpetual Rubik's cube to try to like line all that stuff up. So I think there's a lot of benefit to having kind of one centralized team that can kind of flex up and flex down depending on the topic versus it just like, hey, it's almost like you need 95 uh, sales folks on Mondays and Tuesdays and then like five on Thursdays. Instead, it's one great team who's kind of handling that increase on the sales side and then that increase on the customer experience side. Oh, I see. You know, when does your season start again and when does it end? Like which months do you operate through for production? Our seasons, uh, our season is April 1st to October 31st. Got it. About two months longer than ours because ours is like May 1st to like September 30th. Mm, roughly. That's basically yeah. a sprint. Yeah, ours is a sprint. Sprint. That's interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah, like pros and cons both ways thrown there too. I'm always sometimes talking to guys in Florida or Texas, and like they're just working 12 months a year at minimum 11 months a year. I'm like, geez, this is a completely different business sometimes. What does March look like for sales for you guys? Is it is it's, it dead because people aren't thinking about it yet? Given that the season starts later. Yeah, well, we do all the cold outreach, like all the past cancels, all the past estimates. Yeah, yeah, we do the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so we just call them. We we start them kind of even like in February too, like two months before the season starts. Um, but it's just cold calling. We get a few leads here and there, but the leads, like the inflow doesn't really honestly happen until like April 20th, like two weeks before yeah. production starts, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Within that a regular so year, the, uh, the lawn care tsunami will hit about April 20th and go throughout all throughout May. This was a really yeah. warm May though, but it was a very cold April and May. So it was kind of weird this year, but yeah, March is a great time to get the reps in. If you're new to sales really and, and customer service, like practice on these kind of calls. Cause these are past estimates and these are previous uh, cancel status sixes that you can get the reps in before like that when that long care tsunami comes those leads calling in you've got one shot and you better make a count yeah so ever take totally. me through as well um so like you guys operate for i guess like eight months of the year if my math is right eight months of the year what do you do seven. for a company of oh, seven okay what do you do for the other five months you have like uh, you said 100 employees right 67 technicians the rest are like customer service sales what do you do with those 100 employees for like those five months when you're not putting down fertilizer yeah so on the technician side unfortunately we do do layoffs um so um on the operation side service managers are year round branch managers are year round account managers are year round and i'll give you some context on that in a, in, in a minute um but yeah unfortunately we do do um layoffs um in the winter which is a bummer um we we try to be as helpful as we can in regard to finding folks winter work a lot of it are, are snow jobs, which are certainly tough gigs, you know, but if, if, if someone's interested in trying to find a particular role, we try to help them find that role. But, you know, there, there's not necessarily always a wealth of options in the winter for the work that, that folks are working on uh, or that are looking for. On the account management side, um, the second season ends, it's big time renewals. So renewals, November, December, you know, just trying to get as, as many folks uh, through the door as possible on a, on a prepayment perspective. And then... You know, a little bit of December, January training uh, on the account management side, a lot of kind of like year end account cleanup, cleaning up notes, reviewing accounts, what have you. And again, training February, we do uh, a green school. Basically, we've uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst has a very cool green school program that we work with them directly on. So we do, you know, four, four weeks you know, a day a piece roughly, uh, where we do bring in technicians into the branches and account managers participate in that green school training, um, which is awesome, you know, two levels and all that. So I always think of it as kind of like, it's like a pit stop on a, on a, on a race car race of like, you kind of roll your vehicle in, you do everything you could possibly think of to make it as great as possible. And then you roll it out. The off season always goes much faster than I think we all want of like, we have all these dreams of all these things we want to improve. Um, and it, it, it does go very quick. You have renewals, training, new things, and then the season starting, you know, before you can play. Uh, I know it goes like so fast, man. It's like, it's crazy. So take me through, like a lot of people are like wondering, like, how do you renew? I know you guys had a really good retention rate like last year. What was your retention rate? And then secondarily, how do you renew your customers? Are they on auto renewal? Do you have to renew every customer manually? What's your process for getting a high renewal rate from your customers? Yeah. So I would say uh, in terms of our specific renewal rate, I would say it's quite good. Um, I, I think we haven't quite figured out the, this, this, the secret, the secret on that. Obviously like step one is, um, you know, provide as great a service as you possibly can. The other thing is we just, you know, and maybe we over communicate, we try to give customers every bit of context of like, what is changing, if anything, to their price, to their program, the products, talk to them about what services they want to renew, not renew, um, you know, notes on their account that might not be applicable anymore. But to just, you know, really have a conversation with them of like, 
what do they want to see differently? Is there anything they're worried about with these upcoming changes? Um, so, you know, when those conversations happen right after the end of the season, I think they're pretty great in a lot of ways. And I, you know, hopefully customers feel accordingly. I think after that, we're trying to figure out the balance of like, we're very determined to find out if folks are going to confirm services or not. But if you're a customer and it's like December 20th and someone's, you know, calling you and leaving multiple voicemails about whether you want to renew or not, you know, we're excited to hear from you, but like the customer's kind of like enough, enough, enough. So I think oh, we, we know that. we yeah. know that. Yeah, we've tried that. We tried like 20 touch points in the off season. It's, that was a disaster yeah. renewal season. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we do auto renew, but we want to mm -hmm. confirm services, you know, ideally with everyone. So I think figuring mm -hmm. out that balance of like giving everyone the context, having those conversations with them, you know, sometimes requires a couple touch points. People are very busy, but then obviously not going overboard of like, you know, reminding people six ways from Sunday that they're going to have a bill at March for their lawn yep. care. When it's December, they're just worried about Christmas shopping and they're just like, canceling just to be like be done with you not because necessarily the service was bad but um for us 75 percent of our cancels actually happen in between seasons only 25 percent is actually during the operation of the season itself so i think there's a lot of room for us to continue to make improvement there of like how do we make people aware we're not trying to bait and switch or anything of that ilk we want to have that conversation to make sure we're starting the, the season on the right foot but again not overdo it to the point where people are like just stop calling me for the love of God. <laughs> yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Interesting. Um, so, what is your guys' like goal for mainly grass? Like right now, you're doing roughly like fifteen million in revenue. Where do you want to take this company as a CEO? What's like your B hag? What's your big goal for this business? So, I'm not, I'm not really like a a, a big old guy like that per se. Um, I do, I do think we have a very meaningful opportunity to continue to to grow our customer count in the geography that that we occupy. You know, we're not perfect, but we're certainly you know, proud of the service we provide and feel like there's an opportunity to, to bring that to more customers, um, you know, and, and kind of help them help them really realize the potential of their outdoor space. You know, the thing that is always striking for me is that we have some zip codes where we have 10% of all houses and we have other zip codes that look a lot like that, where we only have, you know, 0.5% um, in terms of like similar demographics, similar kind of income, similar you know, properties, all that. So that always feels like incredible opportunity of like, clearly this is working really well over here. So, you know, what do we need to do, um, you know, to convince this customer base that looks a lot like this one in this new zip code, you know, that we can really be a great, a great service provider for them. So I, th I, th I think the thing for us is there's just a lot of opportunity there. I think there's opportunity to potentially, you know, do some big leans there. We did do an acquisition in the off season this year and, you know, I think we're, we often lean towards more on the organic growth side, um, but you know I think I think acquisitions are, are an option. But I think we have a ton we have a ton of room to roam, both in terms of like always improving our service, but also you know better communicating with our customers and prospective customers that you know, we can really be a great service provider for them. Very cool, very cool. So like regarding your marketing strategy like right now, what do you guys do? Like what's like is it Google Ads? Is it SEO? Is it like Facebook ads? Is it direct mail? What's working for you in Portland, Maine? Yeah, definitely. One last thing on the growth thing that I think is really important is like it's it's not always just about growth for growth's sake. That like growth provides an incredible array of opportunities for the folks here. You know, as I mentioned, it's such a bummer to have to do layoffs in the winter. So, you know, for example, this year we were able to give one of our master technicians an opportunity to become a service manager. Great master tech and unsurprisingly he's proven to be a great service manager. Being able to provide those opportunities is just awesome. And growth really, really provides a lot of that. So, so that's that's a big one there. On the marketing side, I mean, we're we're tr we're trying a lot. We're very Google Ads heavy. We can now track that full funnel, you know, so we know exactly what our win rate is off a lawn care ad. I think which is super helpful in terms of determining our willingness to pay, which is great. That being said, you know, I just think there's a cap on that volume you could drive there. So I think we're always trying to figure out like what is a better way to do this. Big thing for us is you know focus on website conversion of like people coming in and ultimately requesting a quote, but also what can we do during that quote request process that, you know, ultimately sets sets that quote request up for success. I think we're just kind of at the early innings of that. We started doing SEO stuff. The whole thing seems a little bit like a black box to me, but I would say we're making headway. The whole thing seems very confusing. You can't pin anyone down on exactly like, you know, the provable ROI all the time, but uh, we're doing that. We're starting some brand awareness stuff this year, you know, sponsoring little league teams. Um, again, in those targeted zip codes that I was talking about, you know, spiced up, spiced up the yard signs, 
Um, we did uh, tips on the back, inspired by you guys. Um, there we go. Irrigation tips. Yep, yep, yep. There it is. And I, I do think we're going to lean in probably a bit more on the brand awareness side. Um, you know, some stuff that's not necessarily quantifiable, but I think could move the needle for us. Um, and then I think really being more thoughtful on the outreach and follow-up side, trying to make that more personalized and targeted as opposed to, you know, the bulk outreach of to 8,000 people of previous rejects who had requested lawn care at some point. So, and the other thing is just, you know, really improving kind of the, our sales training and our sales process. But I would say we, we've, we've far from figured out the, the magic touch. And uh, I, I feel like that's a, a big opportunity for us. We just brought on a director of growth to lean into that all, all a lot further because I feel like there's a big opportunity for us there for sure. In today's day and age, what makes mainly grass, what, what's your competitive advantage versus your competitors? What makes you guys different? So I think there's two parts of it. I'll start with one, even though it's it's, it's not the most important. I, I think scale, I think scale can just be a huge, huge asset in terms of, I think there are big investments on the, let's say it's the infrastructure side or the training side or HR being a huge one and recruiting that are truly impactful to the business and help us deliver a better service to our customers that I think are really hard to, it's hard to make those investments at a smaller scale because it's harder to spread that cross that cost out, out uh, across many things. You know, you can spend a lot more on a training for 67 people than you can for five, right? So I think, I think that's a, a big advantage for us and that helps us deliver a better service to our customers. And then the other one, uh, you know, I know it's cliche, but we do really give a shit about what we do. I think a small example of kind of like both these things is we track material usage on a daily basis, which obviously requires some infrastructure to do, but we care to make sure that like we're putting the right amount of product on customer properties. Um, and I think as kind of like the give a shit piece, there's no trophy for under applying, right? Sure, you save money, but um, you've under delivered what you've promised to a customer and ultimately their results are gonna, are gonna suffer. So I think we do a lot um, to ensure that we're delivering as good a service as we possibly can, the service that we're proud of and hold ourselves accountable to that. I think it's that scale thing. And I think we are very much oriented and build around, um, you know, that give us a factor of, of making sure we're holding ourselves accountable to, you know, delivering a great service to our customers. That's incredible. Um, can you just like take me through, just don't get into like too many details, but like with the product tracking, how do you do that? Do you just like have like a like on your Lesco spreader, your Anderson spreader, how do you track the amount of bags of fertilizer or the, or the grams? And then for like your weed control, how do you track that? Just give like a high level view and why why that's important to you guys. Because you guys are probably burning through, I'd imagine almost like 10 to 50 grand a day in materials. Yeah, at least. Um, you know, it's better, it's better when I could just give you the, you know, the quick answer if we track usage on a daily basis. I would say it's a ton of brain damage in practice. Yeah. Like Excel um, sheets think- or what? What do you guys Dude, use? So many sheets, all the sheets, yeah. Google sheets, <laughs> these sheets, those sheets. Um, what started for us is um, just tracking material usage on a monthly basis. Um, yeah. You know, so there's obviously pieces to that. It's like, you know, small things of like, you got to receive those invoices in quantities. Then you got to make sure that like what you've received in inventory actually matches the invoice. All those building blocks are super important to make sure that you have like an accurate baseline of usage, right? And then you have to have your like, this product has this spread rate associated with these service codes. So you gotta have all that infrastructure. And then, you know, on the daily basis, um, and that part's kind of like sort of easy, sort of not once you set it up. And then the daily stuff is about, and I think this is the hard part, is, um, you know, getting folks to log their material usage on a daily basis. Hey, I use this many bags across the day. I use this many ounces for this product, what have you. Um, that part, you know, people obviously fill it out. You know, there's, there's very few instances now of people not, you know, filling out the Google form at the end of the day. I think it's just like units of measure can be really confusing. People could fat finger, mismeasure, there's still liquid in the tank, you name it, right? And I think figuring out the balance of like, hey, where do we want to dig in? Being like, hey, this this tech seems like it's he or she is under applying. And where is it just like a typo or a numerical thing or something that's going to resolve itself in four days? Because it's they're not really under applying. There's actually just a lot of liquid left over in the turf code, what have you. So I, I don't think we've t- quite like cracked the nut of like efficient and effective daily tracking. We do track it. We do get dig into it. 
um, and it has yielded some great corrections and results and what have you. Um, but there's a lot of time and energy that goes into that on a daily basis. So like we're ultimately getting to the end outcome, which I think is great. There's just a lot of time and energy that goes into it right now as we're continuing to refine the process. We use sure. scales. But we use scales for a while, yeah. weighing product. I mean, wow. yeah, yeah. Well, I visited your guys' shop like a year ago, right? And like, I could not believe like the, the Power BI and your Tableau, like the data at Mainly Grass was like second to none. Like you guys knew everything, like these crazy metrics. Like I am a technical person. Like I, I, I'm an, I have an engineering degree. It's like, I love math, right? And like, I've never seen like the level that you guys brought of like knowing all this data. Could you tell our audience what are kind of like the key metrics that you guys measure on like a daily, weekly or monthly basis that really helps to move your business forward? Yeah, so um, I think I think the, the biggest things for us are budget versus actual, which is basically like the estimated time to complete a service, drive to a stop versus how long did it actually take? And, you know, beginning of end of day being part of that. So that's one service call rate. And again, we do this like by branch, you know, by technician service call rate, number of services performed versus you know, number of service calls associated with it. There's some waiting, some fancy stuff there. And then customer satisfaction, which is faces in the email. That's ultimately linked back to the tech and the branch. Beginning of end of day time, which is kind of part of that budget versus actual. But, you know, I think that can be often, often a black hole of time. Material usage, you know, we have a career ladder. So a lot of that, those stats are kind of against the career ladder. You know, we obviously track employee retention for new employees, existing employees, how many weeks they've been here. But I think, the biggest thing is it's not really necessarily about the numbers themselves. It's really like, hey, are we making progress or not? You know, and holding ourselves accountable for that progress. Because it's great if, you know, it's theoretically great if you like know a number for something, if it's overperforming or underperforming. But if it's underperforming and you don't know what to do next, like that's not really a useful metric, right? So I think we're always trying to figure out that balance of like, it's not the, the numbers are to track something else. Like, a service call holds us accountable for service quality, but the goal isn't the service call. So I think always making sure that we're like zooming out of like, okay, this is a helpful thing of like showing if this technician is getting worse or getting better, but like ultimately how is that, you know, what matters more is like, how am I coaching that technician? What am I following up with that technician to drive progress or not? So we do track a ton of stuff. I think we're always just trying to figure out that like it doesn't become a distraction and it's, it's really a useful tool to help you know, branch managers and service managers and whoever else really, really drive progress for the business. And then we track a million of them, you know, win rate, win rate by line of business, you know, cancel rate, cancel rate by branch, you know, all that stuff, you know, retention, was it a voluntary termination or involuntary termination, all that stuff. Wow. Do you guys, do you ever think that you track too many metrics? I'm not saying that you guys do. I'm just curious because I've seen your guys' place and it's insane with the data. Do you ever think sometimes Hey, instead of like having 50 metrics, we just get five key metrics. Yes. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. I think we're just trying okay. to figure out which ones to cut. I think we're just trying okay. to figure out which ones to cut. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I would so, say by and large, it's like we make things more complicated before we kind of simplify them. Because I think the thing that's tough about having all this data is that like you see all these things. So when you're cutting down, you're deliberately letting go of certain things. So like, let's take material usage, you know, it, let's say you over applied by 160%. That's super worrying, but it's only $200 because it's one product and you over applied and you're not at, you know, such a high rate that it could damage the lawn. So just spending a couple bucks there, like, is that really worth the dig in? Right. you got these other bigger ticket items that you care more about being right. So I think the thing that's tough of like knowing all this stuff is that you deliberately have to be like, this is not a big enough metric or a big enough number for it to be like a top thing we're caring about. So I think that's what's tough about that simplification is that like you do lose things along the way and just figuring out like what are the things that are worth giving up so you can better focus on X, Y, Z metric. I think the things like we care a lot about like fairness, fairness for the technicians, fairness for the managers. And when you try to have like a perfectly fair system, you you do also end up with way too many things as well. Talk to me about like how you pay your technicians. Like I know we, we talked to you about the P for P, like the, you know, pay them by a percentage of production. I know you guys don't do that, but how do you guys do it? How do you guys incentivize it uh, for the technicians? Yeah, so um, we have a career ladder. Um, so technicians are able to move up the career ladder and they have an hourly rate associated with each stage on the career ladder. And each stage also comes with, you know, 
metric performance, right? And that's part of it. A, a big chunk of it is knowledge around the products we use, using real green, preventative maintenance, process and procedure, you name it, and then metrics are a part of it. So, um, you know, we have these career ladder tests where folks can move up on this career ladder. Um, and then, you know, obviously the standards and expectations uh, go up as, as they go up the career ladder. So that's kind of how we link it up. It's not, you know, a bonus tied to specifically to production or anything like that. I think it goes back to the fairness thing that, you know, let's say you were to bonus by stop. Well, people have very different routes, right? You could have someone who's just crushing services, but they don't have a super dense route. You know, they're not going to get as many stops done as someone who might have a crazy dense route, but, you know, might might not be moving that quick or what have you. So that's where I, th- I think the, the career ladder is kind of very transparent, very clear cut, sets the expectations, you know, hopefully in a very clear way. Um, again, a lot of in- infrastructure around it, but, um, you know, hopefully it's, it's, uh, it's something that the techs are excited about and something they can, you know, move up and take advantage of and, and really have a, have a career here with it. Got it. As we come to the end of our time here, Edward, like when you went from the transition from CFO to CEO, what kind of leadership training or uh, different types of procedures did you have to go through to really get yourself to be uh, to that kind of level? Because it's no, it's no small joke being a CEO of a $15 million company. What kind of training do you have to go through? That's a great question. Um, I have a, a great uh, mentor slash manager in, in Palmer, who was previously the CEO of Mainly Grass, uh, who was just instrumental in kind of getting up the curve. Uh, I think it was like probably the first month where, it, uh, cause I would obviously call him with like, what's this, what's that? And, you know, how should I handle this, this, this or that? And very early on to his credit, he, 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 he stopped answering my questions um, because he knew that like, I was just like so overwhelmed with all these things. I was just gonna like take that answer and run with it. So instead we were kind of like talking it out, walking through the thought process and all that. But I think that was a huge, huge part of um, uh, kind of getting up the curve. The other thing is the mainly rest team is, is, is honestly phenomenal and was, was super helpful and they're a great group to, to, to lean on and, and count on. So I think that was a, a big piece of it. I would say I'm very much like in the early innings of, of figuring it all out. But I, th- I think the only thing I would say from like a training perspective is I just think it's important to like very much be true to yourself from a management style perspective, from an organization perspective. It's easy to re- read some book on management and be like, I'm going to be this, I'm going to do this. But it's not true to you. Like people can feel that it's quite hollow. So I think that's a big thing of like, you know, just be be honest with yourself of like, you know, what's your management style, what's your leadership style, what have you. And I think the other thing is I was backfilling myself on the CFO side as I became the CEO. So I didn't come in with some like, you know, grandiose plan from, you know, that could have been out to lunch. Um, it was very much like the focus was on just like we had a lot of things to do. And ultimately, I think that was beneficial because then over time, I think you kind of refine of like, hey, what do we want the vision for this to be? What do we want our you know, values to be and, and start to kind of refine those and make it more explicit. Where I think when you're first in, I think it's tough to to kind of with confidence say those things because like you have a lot to learn as well. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. Well, Edward, thank you so much for taking the time, man, and joining us in the dirt life. It's so viable and some, someone that's in the weeds, no pun intended, with such a big company there essentially. And man, it's been awesome to get to know you more over the years in your company. And hey, we're going to see you in a couple of weeks in Napa. Let's go. Looking forward to it. Appreciate you guys having me on. Thank you. Yeah, you betcha. Take care. Bye-bye.